Good morning, um, actually good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Traeger and I am the chair of the Committee on Recovery and Resiliency. We are here today to discuss the city's most recent efforts in assisting vulnerable populations in emergency evacuations. A significant number of vulnerable individuals in the city experience greater risk during emergency situations. Superstorm Sandy underscored this problem. There were an estimated 75,000 people in, in poor health living in areas that were inundated by floodwaters and estimated 54,000 more in communities that lost power. These people faced additional dangers during the storm as they were less capable of gaining access to needed care. At our last hearing in January on this topic, the administration testified on the deliverables they are undertaking as a result of a settlement between the city and the Brooklyn Center for Independence of the Disabled. Today, we like to learn about the city's progress in reaching those goals. Of great concern are the city's plans to reach residents immediately after an emergency to provide assistance and evacuate if necessary, particularly those in high-rise buildings. In the absence of a voluntary directory to reach our most vulnerable New Yorkers in times of emergency, we like clarity on the city's most uh, post-emergency canvassing operation plan and inform, uh, on information on its implementation timeline. Um, thank you to those who prepared uh, for today's hearing, uh, Vanessa Ogle from my staff, um, Malika Jabali, our committee counsel, and senior policy analyst Patrick uh, Mulvihill. Uh, the committee looks forward to hearing uh, today from New York City Emergency Management, uh, as well as advocates. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to call on, on the administration for the first panel. And I know that we have been joined by my colleague, Council Member Margaret Chin. Um, if we could just ask the panel, uh, please raise your right hand. Uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth and to answer truthfully to Council Member questions? May, thank you. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Pearson Traeger, members of the Recovery and Resilience Committee. I'm Jim Esposito. I'm Deputy Commissioner Planning for New York City Emergency Management. I'm joined here today on my right by Cleo King from MOPD. On my immediate left, Fred Villani, Chief Fred Villani from FDNY, and David Starr from DOHMH. I'm pleased to be here today to provide information on the work that the city has undertaken to be certain that vulnerable populations are aware of and use resources available to them before, during, and after emergencies. City agencies work in optimal ways to reach large segments of the city's vulnerable population and to incorporate planning into cohesive coordinating strategies. To accomplish this, the city created Disability Access and Functional Needs, known as DAFN, positions at key city agencies. Across the city, the core function of this expanded DAFN staff is to integrate the needs of people with disabilities and others with access and functional needs into their agency's emergency planning, training, outreach, and response. NISM has also coordinated the Disability Community Advisory Panel, a collaborative entity through which the city gathers expertise, input, and feedback from members of the disability community and its organizations regarding accessibility issues arising from current and future emergency planning proposals that impact people with disabilities. The NISM-led advanced warning system, known as AWS, is designed to alert organizations who work with people with disabilities and access and functional needs to various types of hazards and emergencies in New York City that may affect people's independence and daily lives. Participating organizations receive public preparedness and emergency information intended for use by individuals with disabilities or access and functional needs. These organizations then relay this information via email, text, or direct call to their clients and other agencies. As such, emergency information is ultimately provided to individuals through trusted pre-existing relationships and specific to their need. Often, that organization will play a role in that person's emergency plan as they provide an essential service that enables their continued independence in the community. Our partners work to help vulnerable populations during emergencies, and we would like to highlight a few of these initiatives. The fire department delivers services to vulnerable populations through different programs. For example, the homebound evacuation operation known as HEO, 
coordinates evacuation assistance in a blue sky environment beginning 48 hours before a known event up to zero hour for those homebound individuals who may need assistance and have no family, friends, or neighbors or contracted providers available to assist may call 311 for assistance using city resources to evacuate. The evacuation operations involve personnel and assets from DOE, FDNY, and MTA paratransit. Individuals request, requesting assistance through 311 are asked a series of questions to assess their mobility, which then categorizes them into one of three transportation assistance levels. The use of these levels allows the city to assign the appropriate transportation resource and assistive personnel for each evacuation request. The destination for these individuals will be either an evacuation center for assignment to an appropriate evacuation shelter or a hospital. FDNY continues to expand resources available to vulnerable populations through its work as part of the High Rise Task Force and High Rise Implementation Committee, which incorporates perspectives from a range of municipal agencies as well as subject matter experts. FDNY is developing new instructional materials including a residential emergency preparedness guide that will provide information on a range of emergencies for the occupants in residential high-rise buildings. FDNY is also in the process of updating the notices it requires building owners of certain occupancies to place on the back of all apartment doors. The notices will be modified to contain larger font and outline instructions for building occupants to refer in case of fire or non-fire related emergency events. A residential building owner's emergency preparedness guide to enhance emergency preparedness among the occupants in residential high-rise buildings is currently being developed. The guide will emphasize the importance of communicating with all building residents on emergency planning especially those who are disabled or have an access or functional need and have an identified barrier to evacuating on their own. The High-Rise Implementation Committee is further working to improve communication and coordination for vulnerable populations through upgrades to enhance 311 in order to increase the real-time data sharing capabilities between 311 and emergency service providers. FDNY also continues to expand everyday resources available for individuals with disabilities. For example, as of August 2017, FDNY vehicles have been outfitted to transport wheelchairs and other disability aids along with patients. The New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, DOHMH, has developed a plan for door-to-door -door canvassing to identify individuals who need assistance in impacted areas after an emergency and connect them to support services. The PICO operation, the post-emergency canvassing operation, is staffed by city employees and volunteers and facilitates equal access to services that the city provides post-emergency for individuals who are unable or who have difficulty accessing those services because of their disability or access and functional needs. PICO is intended to rapidly identify residents who need the city's assistance in order to connect them to services before their needs become acute. PICO may be activated for disasters that significantly disrupt the delivery of essential services, primarily electricity, to more than 5,000 households for more than 48 hours. In these scenarios, DOHMH will analyze the impact of disasters, existing city vulnerabilities, including the location of vulnerable populations known to the city, and the mayor's office will review this recommendation and decide whether to activate PICO. So these are merely some of the examples of the many ways in which the city agencies are working to address the needs of people with disabilities and access and functional needs during disasters. So thank you for your interest and continued support, and we're here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have any opening statements? Or? Uh, we've also uh, been joined by Minority Leader uh, Councilmember Stephen Matteo. Um, so I just want to 
I have some prepared questions, but I just want to just follow up on some of the testimony we heard. Um, the uh, New York City led the advanced warning system known as AWS. It says the information uh, can be shared, uh, email, text, direct call. What happens in the event if communication systems are down? H how, how is that, how is information then uh, relayed? Well, AWS is meant to be a force multiplier, uh, and the capability exists in a whole variety of ways to message individuals. It could be via a uh, typical landline, it could be through SMS messaging, it could be through text. Uh, uh, so, you know, we have a robust system in place. Uh, if landlines aren't operating, text messages uh, may be uh, well, because available. The, the problems we faced uh, during Sandy was that we, we did not have service. Um, well, during Sandy, uh, we worked with our local telephone providers, uh, Verizon, uh, Sprint, and they have really hardened and made redundant a lots of these systems. Now, I'm not excluding the possibility of certain things happening, but AWS is just one of the means that we use to provide information to uh, these vulnerable people, those who are disabled. We have a whole bunch of other ways we go about it. Uh, would you like me to explain a little bit? Only because we, you know, uh, we passed a bill, and the mayor signed into law, it was actually my bill, uh, asking the, the, the task force on climate change ad adaptation to include in it a communications resiliency plan. Right. Because uh, at, at, at a prior hearing, uh, Commissioner Esposito testified that residents are still encouraged to call 911 during emergencies in the scope of a Sandy, and I had mentioned that people could not get through to 911 during Sandy, I myself included, um, and uh, service was down for, for, for many people. Um, so how do we reach people during times of emergency during this time? And so that was the question that we need to figure out uh, with com you know, communications uh, companies and some companies were more willing to work with us than others. Uh, some of them are citing uh, their patent concerns, privacy concerns, which I, I, I get that, but we in the government have a public interest, a big public interest, to maintain communications during emergencies. So which, you know, and, and so my, my recommendation was to create a set of standards for companies to follow, particularly those companies that have um, franchise agreements with the city of New York that if they want to do business with us and, and do business here, they have to, to work with us to make sure that we can reach people during times of crisis emergency. So I, I'm very interested in hearing right. other ways of you know, reaching people during this So, so the AWS uh, messaging is generally utilized in that blue sky environment before a storm actually hits, and we are urging people to prepare to make plans, and the message is uh, being amplified through a variety of sources, through a variety of organizations, whether it be websites, whether it be uh, communications, text messages, Notify NYC. So that's what happens with the AWS. This is when AWS is really beneficial, is before the actual storm hits. So during the storm, uh, we have a whole bunch of strategies that we use uh, via 311 system. And depending on what time frame we are from actual impact, from actual zero hour, New York City Emergency Management is pushing information out through, uh, again, a variety of sources. And uh, we are providing 311 uh, with information on what to uh, tell people who are calling, looking for information, looking for assistance, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's how we uh, address, uh, you know, uh, pr those uh, questions uh, in the very uh, uh, small window within the 48-hour uh, uh, period, time period, 
from when that storm is going to impact us. And then when the storm impacts us, uh, when we're getting close, uh, we are messaging people, well, now it's time to shelter in place. And uh, in a post-storm environment, we have uh, the FDNY still conducting uh, post-incident uh, HEO for a period of time until the PICO operation can get up and running. And the PICO would be addressing those people who, for one reason or another, cannot actually uh, make a phone call. Uh, and we are uh, zeroing in on particular uh, locations in those uh, uh, evacuation areas uh, and uh, knocking on doors. So there, there is a whole continuity of effort in place to address uh, all of the questions that you're asking right now. Uh, we have NYPD amplifying messages uh, in a pre-storm uh, environment uh, in that 48 hour, minus 48 hour window, uh, instructing people, you live in an evacuation zone, it's time to leave. And uh, we have fire picking up immediately after the incident, uh, uh, you know, addressing people's calls for help or for uh, removal in the event they didn't and there were no elevators uh, available to assist them down to the uh, uh, ground floor and uh, no transportation assets that uh, are currently running and uh, they would address that need. And then again, once PICO is up and running, uh, you, as you will hear, uh, we do have special plans in place to uh, address those uh, transportation needs as well. So, uh, and as far as the power goes, the power MOU that we had as part of the uh, BCID lawsuit that you had referred, we had worked with our Con Ed partners, our PSE and G partners, our Brooklyn Union Gas partners, and we put into place uh, a lot of uh, our plans uh, where uh, information is being provided to us and we're pushing information out to our uh, uh, AWS providers, our Citizen Corps uh, uh, partners uh, and our nonprofits uh, through multiple levels to get uh, required information to the people who need the information. So, uh, but how, I, I remain concerned again, and this is, I'm, I think we still need more information and clarity from our, the, the private industry that governs a lot of our uh, communication infrastructure, but I remain concerned about how to reach emergency officials during the emergency. Well, uh, because I, I appreciate the fact that within, between 48 hours before a storm or before an emergency, people can uh, contact, you know, 311, contact 911, contact your office, and get a lot of very good information. The question becomes, how do you make sure that we're reaching them or we're connecting with them during, during that actual emergency well, when we expect to lose power? No, I hear you. And, you know, we have mayor's press conferences. We have the mayor's press office. We have a joint information center that's standing up in New York City emergency management with all agencies being led by the mayor's office. Uh, we have elected official calls. We're pushing information out. We have... Uh, not only our agency uh, media outlet and websites that are pushing information out, but uh, partner agencies as well. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, an access and functional needs working group, and uh, we are pretty robust in information and identifying uh, who we can push information out through to the people who need it. So. There is a lot that has taken place, a lot of uh, planning, a lot of effort, and uh, we have some fine systems in place right now. During the storm, it's basically a, uh, a rescue operation. You have uh, FDNY out in the uh, field, at least they were during Sandy. You have NYPD out there making rescues on a need type of a basis. There are a lot of municipalities who uh, just shelter in place. Uh, they basically essentially tell occupants in those areas that should be evacuated that uh, you're on your own if you do not evacuate. We do not do that here in New York City. We have not done it up to this point in time, but uh, they you know, the emergency response uh, agencies have reinforced their capabilities in just those particular areas. If I may, I, I, I was uh, 
told at a prior hearing uh, by folks testifying that um, the fire in Breezy Point during Sandy was not called in through a phone call but through a firebox. It, is that y your recollection as well? I, I believe that is what I understand, yeah. yeah. So that is further evidence of th the difficulty in connecting to 911 through, tr through traditional means in the sense where people could not get through because people came to testify that and they spoke to the council that they could not reach 911 during that time. And there was this massive fire that broke out. And again, to the credit of, of our New York's bravest, did a phenomenal job of addressing that situation. Um, my concern is that if it wasn't for a firebox, which some of them I'm not even sure are functional, quite frankly, it not the people that they wouldn't have been wouldn't have been called down. Just on an odd note, I I, I believe over ninety percent of the uh, Rockaway fire alarm boxes are working. Okay. And the Rockaways? Yeah, yes. How about citywide? Yeah, no, please. Okay, that's uh, <laughs> just a point of information. But uh, now I. I I understand that uh, 911 at that point in time was overwhelmed with calls. And again, a lot of these uh, issues, uh, working with telephone companies, uh, expanding that particular capability, uh, expanding mm -hmm. the uh, capability of our 911 uh, central system. I'm not going to say it, 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 it's uh, completely fixed, but uh, they have done uh, a lot of work in uh, providing additional access to the public who may be calling 911 for assistance. So uh, a lot of work has gone that way as well. After Sandy, there were a lot of hearings on uh, 911 and uh, what happened. And uh, No, I, I know that there was a lot of hearings. I'm just not sure what has resulted out of all the hearings. Uh, m my, my issue is that uh, and I, I'm, I'm glad for Rockway residents that the majority, if not all, the fireboxes are working. Mm -hmm. Who checks to make sure that they're working? Is that FDNY? Is that Do It? Is that your agency? No, that's FDNY Communications. FDNY. Right. Um, so who could speak to making sure that they work in Coney Island or that they work in, you know, uh, Red Hook? Uh, who could speak to that FDNY? That would be FDNY. Yeah. Right. And are they? But not Fred. Fred. Not Fred. Not Fred. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not the chief. Understood. It's just, I think we need to be very mindful that folks could not reach people during that time. And it, again, this is not really, this, this, the onus is not fully on you. The onus really, I think, is to engage in our, with, with the private industry to make sure that their communications are resilient. It's actually my understanding that some companies had more resilient technology than others, but it overwhelmed the systems of those that did have resilient technology. But the bottom line is we couldn't get through to people. Um, so I still remain concerned about communication during emergencies. And actually, we're seeing my concerns play out in, in, in Puerto Rico and Mexico and other, other places that are experiencing natural disasters. And I just want to also note that we've been joined by Council Members Eric Ulrich and Council Member Carlos Menchaca. Um, but I, I would like for us to circle back to this issue and uh, about um, – the status of the resiliency plans for, our c for communications uh, infrastructure. Um, you also noted in your testimony that uh, the FDNY, um, ha you know, continues to expand resources available to vulnerable populations through its work as part of the High Rise Task Force. Um, now, are you saying that the FDNY is collecting data from people that need help during? emergencies from high-rise buildings? How, can you explain that further? What exactly is the program? Okay, as I mentioned, that yeah. FIRE right now is uh, engaged in working with members of an implementation committee, and we are uh, in process of putting together, together a residential uh, fire safety guide that would uh, provide lot of information on emergencies, emer pre-emergency planning, and uh, uh, non-fire related emergencies. How does it reach these populations? You want to take it? Well, it reaches the population uh, through uh, potential uh, uh, fire code changes, 
uh, but it's saying that it, it's, uh, it continues to expand resources available to the vulnerable populations through its work as part of the high-rise task force, right. the high-rise implementation committee. That's correct. Right. So, so my question is, how are they reaching those people that need to be reached? Okay. Well, this is still a work in progress. So we're continuing the effort. We're looking at the recommendations made from the high-rise committee. So this implementation committee right now is vetting all of these uh, recommendations and looking to see what we can reinforce, what we can operationalize for the uh, people uh, who need additional services. So it's a uh, method uh, that we will be focusing in on as part of one of the MOUs to uh, provide additional information to occupants of residential buildings. It could be uh, uh, permanent residences, it could be hotels, uh, and this is a strategy that we're using to uh, reinforce uh, certain uh, safety uh, plans so and information. So the high-rise uh, task force met, you're saying? Yes. They met already, this task well, force? Well, we're in process, yes. There, yeah, there's a how, whole many, how many meetings have there been so far? Dozens. Dozens. Yeah. And is there a, a report that came out of the high-rise task force? As well, well we, conti we, we continue to uh, meet internally, and we uh, intend on presenting our findings in a final report to the court, yes. To the court. And how about to the council? Well, we will, you know, when we finish the work. And when do you expect that to be completed? Probably uh, October of 18. Is that's, that's mandated by the court? Yes, it is. October of 2018? That's correct. So there are two guides. I mean, we're looking at a residential guide. Right now, the fire department does have a residential guide on uh, uh, fire uh, safety, and uh, annually it's supposed to be reviewed. Literature is supposed to be handed out by building owners to uh, the residents of the uh, buildings, residents who occupy the buildings. And what we're doing is updating that guide, looking at uh, additional information we could provide uh, residents of the building if they need access and help uh, in evacuation. Uh, we are also providing an owner's guide where we're going to instruct the owners to be more inclusive in their emergency planning to reach out to the uh, disabled population who may occupy your building and to uh, communicate uh, with any individual who may need assistance and find out what their personal plans may be and find out if they need any assistance. Uh, so this guide is not yet made? No, we're in process of doing and it. And right will now. this guide be available in different languages? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you know how many? I don't, I don't. I, I'm just using, you know, Ready New York, we were available in 14 different languages and, uh, you know, we have other uh, pieces of information uh, available in uh, ASL, uh, VRI, Braille, and so on and so forth. Uh. Um, okay. Uh, again, it's just, it's a concern that it's not just, I don't think we should be doing things just because we're mandated. I think obviously we have to be in compliance with, with court orders, but also it's just, it's the right thing to do. Well, this was an MOU that was right. agreed upon with the uh, plaintiffs. Now, speaking of that MOU, I, um, have received information from uh, that there were a list of deliverables, right, that had to come out of the MOU uh, as a result of the lawsuit. Now, the one thing I, I noted in, in that the city's uh, final progress report, um, it notes a different uh, year in terms of compliance with the minimum number of accessible shelters to people with disabilities. Um, I believe we were supposed to have at minimum 60 sites, 60 evacuation centers, mm. ADA compliant by September of this year. Is that correct? No, we did receive an extension. So when did you apply for an extension? 
I, I'd have to bring a lawyer up here, but we did receive because an at my last hearing in January of 2017, I was told that we that we should meet the goal. You yeah, know, we, we we legitimately received an extension, and I believe it's to uh, October of 2018. So the biggest issue with the uh, deliverable of the 60 accessible shelters is the programmatic and processes that are. Uh, required when you bid a contract and when you vet potential uh, folks who are going to remediate certain shelters. It's, it's a whole process thing. That's why we're a little bit behind. We do have right now 34 uh, accessible shelters and in those 34 accessible shelters there are I think 26 of accessible evacuation centers. The other uh, 16 or the other 13 uh, shelters uh, should be accessible. The timeline goes by May of 18, and the additional 13 or so by October of 18. But That's the process. What, what year was the MOU initially uh, completed? I don't have all of that information. Uh, I don't have that information. So I'm being told by staff that it was completed in 2011. Okay. Is that correct, Malika? And 2011 actually predates Superstorm Sandy. Okay. It, I'm not sure if that's actually, there was a lawsuit after Sandy. I'm, I'm, I'm being told 2014. All right. 2014. 2014, right, because after Sandy was the lawsuit. And... Um, the court in the city entered into an agreement that it would take uh, until September of 2017. And you're saying that you granted an extension. Was that an extension? That uh, what was the re what was the the drive for the, ex the push for the extension? Uh, what were the factors that uh, pushed the city to apply for an extension? It was the timing uh, involved and the uh, uh, effort required to uh, remediate the shelters. So far, we have uh, surveyed with Evan Terry Associates 124 uh, shelters. And looking at the 124, uh, we have to uh, make decisions about which shelters, based on a whole bunch of factors, uh, uh, are worthwhile to uh, remediate. So we've been moving along steadily. There's a whole committee and working group that uh, consists of not only emergency management folks and uh, MOPD uh, and uh, DOE, obviously, and we go through looking at the different items that need to be remediated, and it takes some time. I mean, they're working very hard to get this done. But like I said, it, uh, a lot of it had to do with uh, the process of uh, obtaining the funding and uh, bidding out of the uh, contract. And I think the funding, is, the funding is not an issue because the city, you know, under the current administration has seen its budget, you know, blossom by mm -hmm. a lot of money. Right. I think we'd agree on that. So uh, funding has not been an issue, uh, to my knowledge, at this point. Um, and uh, you know, it's one thing if, you, if if I'm hearing that, uh, because some of the sites are schools. Is that correct? They're all schools. Right. So what's been the feedback from the DOE or the SCA about? They're working as hard as they possibly can. I assure you, to remediate all of these facilities in the shortest possible time. Um, it just, in my opening statement, we, we noted that a lot of the areas that were uh, impacted by the storm are areas that also, I know my district, for example, mm -hmm. we have a very large senior population, very large uh, population of people with disabilities. I have hospitals. I have nursing homes. I have adult homes. I have, I have it all. And I am very concerned about... Um, making sure they have access to facilities that uh, can certainly, you know, uh, first of all, take them in uh, and also provide services inside. But that's been a remaining issue um, that, that we have. And I am, quite frankly, disappointed that 
Uh, I was not, this committee was not told of the extension. I, I, I of course, want us to be in compliance with this court order. It's a public record, sir. So we, uh, we went to the court, we received their approval. But with all due respect, you went to my committee of January of this, of this year and said that we will complete this. And I was also told by DOE officials we'll complete this. And advocates ask me, and residents of my district ask me, and we were told that we would be in compliance by this year. And so I, I want us to be in compliance. I want us to do the right thing. But information is important here too. And being straightforward is important. Because we, well, we weren't hiding anything in January. So I would imagine that I would have to check with the legal team. I believe after January, we went back to the court and we asked for an extension. I think it was in April, to tell you the truth, but I'll have to check. And we are working as hard as we can to, as quickly as possible, get all 60 shelters. As a matter of fact, I remember uh, during the education uh, budget meetings, I sat on the education committee and I had a chance to ask the DOE about this very issue. Mm -hmm. And they made no mention of an extension. And I'm pretty sure this is the same period of time that you're talking about applying for an extension. I, this committee, nor was I, was told about this extension. And again, I want to be clear. I want us to do the right thing as fast as possible, humanly possible. It's just I, I would appreciate that we're getting, that we're on the same page information-wise, so we can share with advocates and residents in our districts the correct information. I'll be happy to get back to you with all of the uh, pertinent Great. details. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the, the PICO plan, uh, which we've just talked to some extent. Um, so can you tell us to what extent is the, has the plan uh, been implemented? Are, are, there, are there any reports that we, that we could uh, obtain or that you could share with us about uh, the progress that's been right. made? I'm going to turn this over to David Starr. Who Great. He's uh, commissioner from DOHMH. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I think you're referring to the uh, final progress report. We right. did submit a, dra a final PICO plan to the plaintiffs in early September. They came back with a few minor uh, comments. We made the changes and resubmitted to the plaintiffs. It basically outlines the preparedness activities that we're going to undertake to maintain sort of the canvassing assembly point sites, their identification, the identification of staff, and then the maintenance of the staffing databases as well as the trainings that, uh, training program that we're going to implement on an ongoing basis to make sure that they're all trained and ready to, to respond at the time of. So what were the concerns can you share with us that were raised by the plaintiffs? Uh, specifically for the plan that we submitted, that last plan that we submitted, they're very minor. Um, one was uh, the addition of uh, ensuring that disability advocates are included in the training pro or uh, in a exercise program, which we made that change. Um, the other were some questions about the number of staff that we had, and we clarified that as well, and the number of sort of the technology infrastructure that we knew that we used to canvas and go door to door. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that that's been revised to reflect those concerns? Yes, and d it, for the most part, it was a clarification of the language. For example, uh, the tablet infrastructure that we're going to use um, to go door to door and collect the surveys, survey the population. Um, they had questions about the number of tablets, and we clarified that these tablets that we maintain in stock, ready to go with active data plans, charged, updated, sitting in a warehouse ready to deploy, are just the first wave, and that additional resources can be purchased at time using emergency contracting avenues. And so people with tablets will take this information down, is that correct? Yes. And how do you know where to go with the tablets to speak to people? That's a very good question. Um, what we've tried to do, and we're pretty excited about this, we worked with, over the last eight months, we worked with the Center for Innovation through Data Intelligence in the mayor's office. Um, they have existing contracts with, or existing data use agreements with many of the city service providers like HRA, which is now DSS, the combination of the HRA and DHS, ACS, DIFTA, uh, Department of Finance. They have existing, like I said, existing data use agreements, so we didn't need to get into the weeds of uh, HIPAA compliance and patient data. We only needed aggregate data to an extent. What they managed to do in a very short period of time is take all of these data sets. They met with the group, the agencies, take all of these data sets, and many people are on multiple, on multi are getting services from different agencies. 
um, combine them into a massive database, deduplicate them all, and then give us a report by census block um, of any census block in the city that had 11 or more. Below 11, they're worried about identification, that you can actually find, find the people. Um, but 11 or, or 12 or more uh, people that were on one of these lists, most of which had an element of either disability or senior uh, status. Um, I can run through some of the, the data sets that they had. The, the far, the, the by, lar by far the largest was the Medicaid disability age and blind uh, claims data from HRA. So, <coughs> so to be clear, because, and, and, I, and I think that this is an example of forward planning, and I, I'm actually commending this type of effort. But to be clear, I don't think you were at my last hearing. Was the administration expressed concerns about a proposed bill that I had that granted it, it, it I, I was very open to feedback, which, you know, uh, to create some sort of a voluntary uh, database of some sort of people who, who have issues, whether it's disabilities or seniors who are very fragile, can't move, um, to, to at least know where we're going to help people. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, during the, the Sandy emergency I, I mentioned at the last hearing, it was a guessing game to figure out who needed the help. Uh, there was no lights, no power. We're in staircases going up 20 flights of stairs, right. figuring out who needs medication, who needs help, who needs water. Um, so it was only through just circumstance and through just conversations with people in the dark with flashlights do we figure out who needs what. And the administration said that my bill raised concerns on their part, which I, I understand, but respectfully, there was no counter plan to tell me how we deal with this. And you're, what you're saying is that you, you're, you, you have used existing data mm -hmm. from agencies, right. cross-reference them, and you're creating your own database that way. Is that correct? We're creating a database of vulnerability, what we call it, we call it the PICO Vulnerability Index. So right. we don't have anyone's client information in this database. All we know is we can identify specific census blocks that have a very high number of people that are on one of these lists. And CID, I actually rank them citywide, so we know which census blocks are the most vulnerable, sort of have the highest, like the top 5%, which are the most vulnerable, as indicated by the fact that there are so many people on one of these lists. So what we've tried, what we're working on doing, we've done some preliminary analysis, particularly in Coney Island, it's very easy to see that we don't need to go over here yet. We'll get to everybody eventually, but in the first hours when we're out in the field, the first place we're going to go, we're going to hit this building, this building, and this building, and this census block to ensure, because the likelihood of us finding someone that needs our help is very high in those areas. So You should share that information with the MTA, which still doesn't understand that when people are under evacuation order, uh, how do they go up many flights of stairs to reach a train? Um, because our sites are not accessible for people with disabilities. Uh, so I, but, but I, I applaud you for what you're doing here because this is, I think, this is forward planning, this is responsible planning, and this is sort of along the lines of what I was trying to call for, open to ideas and both constructive criticism but also feedback to kind of get something like this. Because honestly, sir, it was <coughs> very, it was very disheartening, and those images of people in help, in need of help during that time will always be. In, in, in my in my mind, and and so it's it's them who I'm look, looking out looking out for. There were people that were stranded for weeks, yeah. um, so I, I I do appreciate that, um, and I think we we touched upon the issue of the high rise implementation committee uh, the task force. For, and uh, is there anything that can be shared with this committee at this time about any of the? recommendations have, that have been received? I know that you, you said that you're examining to w see which ones can be operationalized. Is there anything that we can see from, from these uh, r r reports so far or notes? So we're looking broadly, uh, maybe at five different buckets. We're looking at communication and training for first responders. We'll look at, we're looking at building owner emergency preparedness messaging. We're looking at uh, building code improvements and uh, how that may support evacuations. We're looking at uh, evacuation transportation plans and we're looking at uh, broad outreach as well as canvassing and tying that together. So uh, I heard uh, 
better communications for first responders. C can you elaborate on that? Training for first responders. Uh, you want to touch base with that? The training uh, and the, the communication that's being referred to is not a technical communications, but better communications between first responders and those in the disability community. So it's not a technological thing, it's, it's a training and awareness thing. Mm -hmm. The reason why I, I, I harp on the communication part is that one of the bills that we signed, the mayor signed into law as well, was the uh, House of Worship Nonprofit Task Force, uh, which did meet and issue a report um, one of the goals of, of that, it was a, it was a bill that, 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 I, that I introduced, was to, first of all, have the city map out all of the organizations that provided help and assistance uh, during and after the, the crisis. The city was actually aware of a number of groups and houses of worship that was doing work. Um, and so it was to kind of create a blueprint, a mapping, uh, a visual understanding of where all these groups are and, and what they did and their capacity. And one of the issues I attended one of their one of, one of the meetings there, and one of the issues that they raised was communication. And so some neighborhoods, I think uh, Red Hook and my and my uh, colleague Councilman Chanka's district, kind of individuals on their own created uh, this like Wi-Fi network, um, not reliant on the government or anyone else, but to kind of to make sure there's communication during and after a storm uh, or after an emergency. I'm just, I just want to make sure that first responders have communication, that they can communicate with each other during, during this time, and also people to first responders can communicate. Um, and so any information on that would be greatly appreciated because if, if there's more work to do, which I think there is, I just need to know what, what, what's needed from us. And the council stands by ready, willing, and able to help push and advocate to the extent possible to make sure that these communication improvements are made. Uh, so can you report back, share anything about whether th the extent to which they have improved communication or? So I, I, just as a point of information, yes. I do know that Citizen Corps is an initiative uh, that we are using to bring together volunteer uh, groups, uh, community groups, nonprofit organizations, as well as the private sector. Uh, and government to promote emergency preparedness at the local level. And right now we have, uh, I guess, over 5,000 uh, organizations that are part of this effort. So that might be a great mechanism to uh, uh, use to bring in these uh, disparate groups that you may be mentioning. And again, I do, I can provide additional uh, contact and information on this. I don't, I'm not the uh, subject matter expert of this outreach effort, but. Uh, we do have uh, a very robust outreach uh, program in New York City emergency management. Right. I mean, I, I, I just, I, I would like to, you know, at, at some point see if these systems are working uh, to, right. without an emergency, maybe to do like yeah. a, a practice drill, a practice run. Uh, do you know if those, are, are any drills have occurred? Or are they, are they? Yeah, well, as I said, uh, you know, we've been very active with our outreach in New York City Emergency Management recently. Uh, over the last several months, we have done over uh, 26 uh, uh, presentations, attended over uh, 16 or so uh, community board uh, uh, meetings, and we uh, discuss our emergency planning, and we provide information uh, to the disabled uh, and those organizations about uh, my emergency plan and pushing out information on the uh, homebound evacuation operation if, if that were to be necessary. So there's a lot of outreach going on and I think the last numbers I looked at, over 6,000 uh, people who were either disabled or who had access and functional needs uh, received information and literature from us. So that had taken place. Uh, we have been working with FEMA out in uh, Staten Island, uh, uh, discussing disability groups and their uh, integration into local emergency uh, planning efforts. Uh, FEMA was on board and they have this uh, community organization active in disasters and uh, we uh, socialized that information with a lot of these partners in Staten Island. Uh, as part of uh, last uh, uh, September's, uh, actually September was uh, national, was uh, uh, 
uh, National Preparedness Month, we were very, very active in uh, uh, conducting. But are, are you aware of any drills or any tests that have been, exercises that have been run me. to test the plan? Okay, so which plan? The, the set of deliverables that have been uh, mandated through court order to see if they're working through the MOU. Yes, we have been exercising certain elements of the plan. Yes, yes. I mean, one of uh, I'll be more specific. Uh, one of the deliverables that are mandated in this is that there, that the city has to run exercises to test components of the fully completed plan. So they want to see if everything that you've committed to do is actually working and actually, you know, if there's to kind of ID any any uh, problems so right. they could be rectified Obviously. before an emergency. Right. right. So have there been any exercises run sure. to test out the plan? Sure. We, we had uh, – go ahead. Do you want to talk I about PICO? I think this is – sorry. I think this is in reference to the PICO plan. That Correct. Yes. Okay. I can I, – I Please. Think I can yes. answer some. Um, uh, in years past, there have been t field tests of the tablets and the communication to the data warehouse. Last June, there was a det there was a, a, a drill that we ran to test the upload of the data, the processing of the data, the generation of referrals to the service partners. And what we did is we had a few rooms of people in the health department that signed up for a few hours, and they tried to overload the referral system. They tried to overload the tablet system. They tried to overload the... Um, the data, the citywide uh, central database, the cent whatever they call it, the Pico data warehouse, um, and then it generated referrals to the referral partners that we have. So food and water referrals went to uh, NISM, as did uh, the transportation referrals, and then we had our partners from the visiting nurse service receiving referrals, and then actually. Um, mimic, mimicking whether they had fulfilled their responsibilities, then uploading that data, and then producing reports on that. So that was, these are the types of drills we've been doing on an ongoing basis. And the most recent sort of physical drills, we actually have purchased a tent city, if I, if I may, um, that would run, so it's several large tents where that would be a canvassing assembly point if we could not identify a hardened structure in an area that was affected. And we tested the setup of one of those tents with all of its associated infrastructure, like power, air conditioning, um, and so on and so forth. So in the PICO plan, we have actually committed to conducting at least one functional element, uh, one drill, functional exercise of an element of the plan on an ongoing basis uh, every year. So we plan on setting up the larger infrastructure in the spring, and then we plan on testing one of the public-facing um, elements of the PICO plan where we can engage the disability community in the, probably in the coming year, summer or fall. Mm -hmm. um, and are there any reports, anything in writing that can be shared with us with regards to, to the results of so far some of these uh, tests or? I think most re these, the, the tent city was kind of, or the tent that we set up was, we just had a summary of key indicators or, or key evidence. Right. Um, I can look and see what we can, if anything is publicly shareable at this point. Right, right, and I mean to be sure, there have been corrective actions found, and things have been worked on. Because I, I just want to make sure that the, the information flow during a cr time of crisis. This is a clear chain of command that y we know where to dispatch these folks to help, and that information is actually reaching those that have to be reached. So. That's that's just the logical sequence. Now, I have some more questions, but I know my colleague is here has a, uh, some questions to ask as well. Uh, first, Councilman Menchaca. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for for coming before this committee today. Uh, so I I know that the chair was was pretty comprehensive in the work, uh, just to understand the the, comp the, the compliance to the, to the MOU and and really just trying to think about where, where we are right now. Uh, there's a lot of conversation about communication to communities, vulnerable communities. Um, I, I would like to know how the work you have done to bring more um, communication to immigrants um, and language access issues and, the, and really define the barriers that you have found uh, in the multiple mechanisms that are going out into communities uh, so tell me about the experience part. I want to know how, how you're experiencing that language access is issue, what you're doing to address those issues, 
Uh, and then I'll have some follow-up questions after that. We have a language access plan uh, in emergency management. We, all of our new, uh, notify NYC messages are available in 14 different languages. We do have uh, on the bottom of well over 100 of our communications a, uh, a link to uh, ASL uh, resources. So we are pretty robust in who we're communicating with, how we're communicating with people. We have a very active program to provide information uh, uh, in a blue sky environment, as well as uh, we have a, uh, uh, a communication uh, uh, access policy uh, and a communication, uh, an accessible communication protocol inside of our shelters. So. We are if I can, if I can yeah, pause yeah. you there, because I, I think what you're, what you're saying is you're translating your information, and that's part of the plan. That's correct. So I, I guess what I want to understand is, and, and really out of just my own experience right. uh, running a district office in a community with right. multiple languages, uh, a lot of our council districts have robust languages and communities. Um, it's one thing to translate something, and that's even, there's a, there's a range of how well you translate information but how do you know that the communities that you're directly communicating to are understanding that information and in the moments where there is emergency had tested that people understood the directions that they were given um, on the ground and I guess that's what I'm trying to understand is the real the real um, understanding of the messages because uh, OEM do OEM as, as an agency I do see you out there in community meetings and and I see that more over time and there are things that are translated but are, are people understanding it and how are you where's that feedback loop from communities uh, that you are trying to communicate in non-english we have a whole external affairs division and these people are pros at what they do I'm not aware of any uh, significant issues. I'm a planner. I'm not aware of any significant issues that have uh, come their way in that I, I haven't heard it discussed uh, as a... Uh, have you asked them that, and, and is, there, is there a way to, to grade that work and, and understand? It's one thing not to have issues, but I guess I'm trying to understand if there's anything out there that, that tells, tells you that there's a marker for understanding in the communities that I, we're serving. Yes, it hasn't l risen to the level of bringing okay. it to leadership's attention. To tell you the truth, I think. So can we follow up job. and maybe we can we can have a I'll conversation with your to. team? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. And and as a member of the committee and the chair, I, I'd like to sit down and have have a have a kind of follow up discussion uh, with your team and and just gauge that with directly with them who are implementing this work. Well, so far this year, we've had uh, the three service centers that stood up. Uh, we had a, a, a big fire out in Queens. We had a big fire downtown in Manhattan. And right now, we have an active service center that is set up uh, assisting the uh, people who may have emigrated here from uh, Texas, from Florida, and or Puerto Rico. So uh, inside the service center, uh, we have made uh, uh, we have enacted our accessible communication uh, policy and protocols, and uh, therein you'll find a lot of uh, uh, people familiar with uh, different languages and uh, any issues that may arise. And uh, you know, uh, you could see firsthand uh, at uh, you know, that location, uh, you know, what we're doing. You know, so. Great. And we can follow up on that as well, a site visit, but also a conversation directly with, with your team. Sure. Uh, what about ethnic media? Uh, so a couple years ago, uh, as a chair of the Immigration Committee, we put together a public hearing on the, the impact on uh, the, the kind of relationship that ethnic media had with city agencies. And is that at all something that's on your radar in your engagement with information, uh, with ethnic media, and, and allowing them to be a... Um, another hand for, for disseminated information? We do have a lot of partners. Uh, I, I, again, I would have to follow up uh, and provide some information for you on that. I That'd be great. And just media. so we, we can be clear, I'd like to get a sense about how much investment is, is made for ethnic media outlets to make sure that we are um, uh, 
many times the communities that are connected to ethnic media outlets are not necessarily connected to other other kind of mainstream uh, newspapers, but read them and would benefit from emergency planning that you're talking about. And I'd like to figure out how we can how we can get that information. So that could be part of our follow up meeting as well. Okay. It it very well may be uh, included right now in our efforts, but again, I'll be happy to follow up. Okay. Good. That'd be great. Just to get a better sense about because all the all the actions on the MOU work are great. How do, we, how do we make sure we communicate that good work uh, and, and grow the number of New Yorkers who are listening to these messages and can get connected to the planning and all the, the, um, uh, the response that's going to happen before, before a storm and right after. And then the, the final thing is just a comment. Uh, I was on the delegation with a city council speaker, uh, Melissa Mark Viverito, who went to Puerto Rico. And I got there on the same day that Team 7 was landing in Puerto Rico and in transition uh, transitioning out Team Six, uh, and I have to say I've never been more more proud of the work um, that OEM and Parks was there as well. They had a, an incredible team out there working on some of the big parks, to getting them getting them opened. The the kind of coordination that I saw was incredible and superb. Um, the kind of documents that they were leaving were were really beautiful. Um, in that they were focused on the things that we know are important to focus in the, mi in the midst of the crisis response itself. All the things that we had learned, the things that this committee has been talking about um, were being done. And it was just beautiful to witness that. And so I, I, I'm really on behalf of that team that went out there, I want to say thank you to OEM, the hard work that is happening outside of the city for New Yorkers that are connected with family in Puerto Rico. Uh, it was just a proud moment. Um, Herman and Johanna, Johanna, uh, are the, were the two leaders, and I just want to say thank you um, to you, to them, to the teams that spent two weeks at a time out there, uh, really helping helping them uh, think about the things that they need to think about right now. But it's so hard when they're they're literally mucking out uh, uh, hospitals uh, and transporting people even now when people are, where people are impacted by a simple rain because of all the source systems. And we know Rockaways, uh, Coney Island, and Red Hook. Today, when it rains, it it floods the entire city. That's happening in Puerto Rico. And, and OEM's team had a huge impact, and I, it was great to witness that firsthand. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, I think this committee wants to definitely echo those remarks that uh, we've seen, heard, and uh, about the amazing efforts of the city emergency officials and all the city agency partners that are down helping uh, our fellow Americans in, in Puerto Rico and elsewhere. So I, I do want to publicly thank uh, the agencies and, and thank all of you for, for, that, for that great work. Uh, and I do also want to just uh, uh, kind of echo the remarks about the inclusion of ethnic media. Um, that was one of my criticisms of the uh, outreach or the lack of outreach from the Build It Back program. Um, when I had Director uh, Amy Peterson come out to my district to do a Build It Back meeting, and I had uh, numerous, numerous homeowners, not one or two, but literally dozens and dozens of homeowners that probably Asian American who had no idea that the program was for them because they never read about it in their paper or heard about it uh, in their ethnic media network. It's it, it really you know we we need to understand that you know we, we live in very diverse communities and again the planning was done before this current administration just like the lawsuit that we're talking about the MOU the lawsuit to my understanding was actually filed filed before Sandy but the report and the MOU was done after Sandy if that's correct so advocates saw this coming before the storm the storm really just e exacerbated. Um, what the advocates, uh, and really just expose what, what, what the advocates were, were, were very concerned about. Um, I want to just uh, go into, uh, can, can the committee uh, have a list of all of the schools that will uh, serve uh, as shelters uh, during a severe storm? And are these facilities, all, are all of them listed online or made available to the public so we can know wh where they're located? Yeah, we have a... Uh and uh, as you are aware, uh, I think it, the portal is uh, maps.nyc.gov slash hurricane. On that portal is a, uh, it's a zone finder. It's an EM app. And you type in your uh, zip code, and it'll give you a listing of the 
local uh, evacuation centers and uh, accessible shelters, for example. So are all schools, all sites listed on this website, or are there schools that you know of that are no, not the, listed on the website? All, all schools are there, uh, including the accessible schools. So uh, that information is available up on our website. Because one of the things I, I expressed concern about in the past with the, uh, with the commissioner was that, for example, in southern Brooklyn, right. in, in my district, the school that people were told to go to was FDR High School, but FDR High School does not have the capacity to accommodate a mass evacuation from all the neighborhoods that are told to evacuate there. So for example, Seagate, Coney Island, Brighton Beach, all the high rises of Warbash from Village Winter Park are all told to go, and even Gravesend are told to go to FDR because it's more centrally located, I understand that, but FDR does not have the capacity for this mass evacuation, and I was told that there, are, the agency is in the process of adding additional sites to deal with capacity. So, do you know, uh, have there been more schools added since 2013? Uh, do you know if are, are we yeah. dealing with? So uh, the way yeah. it works is it, it works like you, th you think like of a solar system. You have a sun, and then you have planets surrounding the solar system. That's the way it works out in New York City. We have uh, 60 evacuation centers spread throughout the five boroughs, and we have some uh, 450 uh, shelters located throughout the five boroughs. And then as people come in and register in an evacuation center, they are assigned a shelter. And once a uh, shelter capacity is met at a certain location, people are directed to a, uh, a different location. Uh, we, we will stand up at, let's say, uh, uh, PS1. Okay, they're at 51% uh, now. We'll stand up PS2 in that solar system to support uh, additional people who may be coming in and registering. So it is a, uh, a method to the uh, sheltering process where there is an intake process. Well, I'm just, I'm just speaking like in terms yeah. of logistics. Right. Uh, the mayor and others have told us the city is growing as far as population size. Right. Uh, we definitely s hear about it and sense it in our neighborhoods as well. Are we, are we increasing capacity? Are we adding more evacuation centers to our list? Are we, have there been new places added since uh, Sandy? To tell you the truth, I think the 450 is uh, uh, the capacity that I know know to be uh, accurate at this point in time. Uh, if uh, we make a decision, you know, uh, based on some analysis uh, that additional capacity is necessary, we could certainly incorporate other schools into the shelter system. Uh, right now... So how many total evacuation sites do you say we have right now in the city of New York? We have 450 uh, Four, uh, shelters. And how, those are all schools? Yes. Uh, we have some CUNY uh, uh, facilities as well, basically. And every single one, and every one of these sites are available online for the public? Yeah, but the, but the process is we direct the public to the evacuation centers first and foremost to register them for the shelter system. So we will have a, uh, th those sites would be uh, identified as uh, evacuation centers. So, right, so out of the four, so you have 450 sites. Right. And how many right now are ADA compliant? We have uh, right now a total of uh, 34 uh, facilities that sometimes dual as an evacuation center. Yeah. 34 facilities are ADA compliant. Right, right right now and, and the goal is 60 s well that's the obligation it's right 60. right uh and do we do we have a, any figures on the capacity of, of those 34 sites yes uh we do i don't have them readily available though yes i'd like to get them well, once you uh once you can get back to me on that okay. uh it, what is the because when i you know in our in our briefing papers before this hearing when, when i'm reading that we literally have tens of thousands of people uh, who are considered vulnerable populations have problems with this you know, issues with disabilities, and uh, I just want to make sure that number one, the sites are compliant, but we just have com capacity. That I know that w in some of the coverage in other states, 
has been so disheartening hearing that some people were turned away because they didn't have capacity or that it, so I just want to make sure that we are you know avoiding some, some of those uh, major major issues um, and are you confident that these shelters, uh, should they be used, hopefully never, right? But are you confident that these sites uh, will, will be adequately staffed? Uh, w what is the plan to make sure that all these sites are not just staffed but also equipped with sufficient supplies? Yes. Now, we uh, – let me just back up one second. We have a whole needs analysis uh, a contract that is coming due very shortly. It will inform planning as to uh, what type of capacities we may be looking at uh, as far as, uh, uh, you know, uh, sheltering the disabled or those with access and functional needs. So the transportation branch plan has recently been updated, uh, led by New York City Emergency Management in conjunction with agency partners and we worked uh, uh, over a year on this plan. So this is a, uh, a broad foundation upon which we'll integrate this uh, new information into this uh, transportation uh, branch uh, planning effort. So uh, that will uh, inform uh, us on what uh, actual needs uh, may be in these areas. So we're eagerly uh, awaiting the contractor to uh, uh, visit and, and it's supposed to be any week now so uh, uh, that'll be uh, uh, very good for this uh, uh, it needs analysis as you just mentioned and uh, as far as the capacity goes uh, no I'm, I'm confident in other words we have uh, provided uh, uh, evacuation shelters uh, uh, that may be required to support up to an evacuation zone six flooding scenario, and that involves, I think it's upwards of 600,000 people. So uh, we do have a capacity to uh, uh, shelter that number, uh, according to current uh, uh, information. Right. I just want to point out that, you know, during, again, during the storm, because this is what we're basing our experiences from, right. you know, not everybody evacuated, as we right. know, right. for a variety of reasons. But those that did evacuate to this to the FDR high school site, the feedback that I got was that they didn't even have enough cots. They didn't have enough certain supplies for those that did. So if we're saying that we you're confident in capacity, are we confident that we have enough supplies, enough you know beds, enough meals, enough water, enough medication if, if necessary to accommodate those that, that do evacuate? We have enough. Uh, food and water in our warehouse for to how long? 70,000 people for uh, uh, it's uh, six or seven days right now. Plus we have contractors that will be coming in after three days uh, on uh, in contract to provide uh, hot meals for so all of the shelter we'll Just go back for a second. You said right. we have enough food and water for MREs water, basic. 70,000 people? For right. I think it's six days. Yeah, for six yeah. days. Yeah, we have. And, and how did we come up with that seventy thousand figure? Well, it, it, it's a matter of uh, looking at the quantity of MREs and water that we may have, c cold food products that we have stored in warehouses, and that is the number we have currently available. And if we need more, and if we need more, we would obviously enact our contract program where we would be using uh, suppliers uh, to come in. And where is the supply house with all this food and water? We have a couple of supply houses located uh, are throughout they, the region. Are they in New York or they're in, in, uh, in other states? Other states. And is that, a pro is that a problem? No, no. It's all according to plan. That's the plan? Because I'm just trying to – I want to understand this. No, if, if I, I got you, yeah. If uh, there's an emergency or if there's some right. crisis for some reason – Sh should it not be based somewhere safe in the cities? It, 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 we, we have it based uh, nearby, yes. Are there, like, privacy concerns here? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I just want to make I'll sure tell you that... you're private. Okay, I just want to make sure okay. that we, we can... Make sure yep. Yeah, you're we welcome. Wanna, yeah. want to make sure that yeah. folks here get the help they, they need and that... Sure. I mean, for example, 
and I again I want to credit uh, the borough president of Staten Island on this. I, I read with, about a year ago or so that he was concerned about uh, power outages in his borough, mm -hmm. and rather than uh, rely on the, the utility companies going across the Verrazano Bridge, he asked them to be stationed in Staten Island already in the event if the bridge cannot be utilized. And that's the type of planning that I think we need to do. Uh, what if our bridges, for some reason, or tunnels are not f operational or functional? So that's something I just want to just want to be, uh, be, be my Is there anything else you want to share with us about Yes, I do. Please. Uh, obviously, I, I left out a critical point. It's OK. The, uh, the Scheldt is are all stocked in a blue sky environment. So this is uh, before the storms, the trucks roll, the pallets are unloaded, and we're placed into the shelters. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, something that is uh, done before the actual And how do we deal with, with, the, with the medication issue? Yes, so we do have a, uh, a service, uh, uh, special medical needs shelters out there. We work very closely with health and hospitals. And we do have a uh, shelter command center, and we do have uh, uh, appropriate people uh, who can uh, make uh, those type of decisions on board, and they're working closely with uh, emergency management. So we. I mean, do for example, yeah, we have doctors and nurses and in special medical needs. But uh, pr like a, a practical question would be: Are nursing homes, which I know some of them are licensed by the state of New York, uh, or, or adult homes, are they required, if they evacuate uh, their facilities, are they required when they drop off their patients or residents to a shelter, are they required to give the city of New York information about their names, what medication they need uh, to survive uh, or to, to live, you know, uh, normally? Um, and does that run into any type of HIPAA concerns? But uh, primarily just keep them alive and to keep make sure that they're healthy and safe. So can you speak to that? Yeah, so uh, Fred just whispered into my ear that uh, the adult care facilities and the right. nursing homes, uh, they're supposed to have plans in place with uh, partners that can accept their patients. They're not supposed to be running to uh, uh, New York City's special medical needs shelters. Mm. Okay. Well, I have to tell so you, I, okay, Andy, no, they no. did not follow their rules. Right. Right. Or if they even had rules at the time. Right. Because they literally drop people off or they dump people at the doorsteps of hospitals with no names, no knowledge of what their conditions were, and hospitals then had to use precious resources and time because they have to first make sure their patients are okay inside, yeah. figure out who they, who they are and what medicine they need. Right. So, I mean, through – through the you know, state health issue. In addition to that, I mean, part of the uh, hospital uh, uh, evacuation uh, uh, protocols, th th there is a state, uh, tech, uh, I guess it's a, uh, a technological solution. They use e-finds, it, it, it's called, where they track patients and that information is part of that system. Uh, so, that's a, that's what I could provide right now. All right. Yeah, I mean, I I understand that these a lot of these facilities are state licensed, and, right. and I understand it's just that they're, they're still city residents. Yeah, no, I understand. And you know, I, I just want to know, have we been in touch with the state about about yes, these issues? Yes, we, we are. Right? We're in conversation with the state all the time. And uh, DOHMH may be able to speak a little bit more. I'd to appreciate it. this because this I, I've heard from a number, not just one, but a number of hospitals, saying that. Patients, residents, vulnerable patients were just dumped at their door. And again, they welcome people because they want to help people, but they have to know who they are and what medicine they need. Yeah, so Can you speak to this, uh, please? I mean, uh, you, and, uh, yeah. I don't want to throw DOHMH under the bus. No, 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 but it's I, not I, them. It's just we uh, have anyway, to deal with this. We, we do have the special medical needs shelters. We have seven of them located throughout the city, and it is staffed by health and hospital uh, personnel in addition to the Medical Reserve Corps and other uh, doctors and nurses. And we do have a, uh, a shelter a command center that coordinates uh, medications and prescriptions, and uh, they will address the needs of patients. Uh, as far as dealing with HIPAA, uh, you know, information, um, I'm not too sure how that works in, in those uh, particular settings. 
but uh, it's all part of a uh, homebound uh, uh, evacuation uh, center uh, uh, plan and effort. It's all part of the uh, transportation plan, the newly uh, the new uh, transportation uh, uh, branch plan that we uh, formalized. So, so, uh, so I mean, again, understanding that you're not the state of New York, you know, right. and we work with the city of New York. I understand that, but right now you cannot speak. <laughs> Can you speak t to your confidence level that what we saw happen during Sandy will not happen again? I, I can confidently, yeah, yeah. We that do we have a, not it will not happen again. No, we, we have come a long way. And we don't rely on outside entities, organizations, or uh, municipalities to necessarily assist us. I mean, we, we are building redundance and uh, internal uh, competence uh, uh, through ourselves and our agency partners. So you're saying that directors of these adult home facilities and nursing homes know what to do today with residents in their buildings? They the should know because this is their responsibility, but we, you know, we're not making any assumptions. Do we know why they didn't follow the rules last time? I, I do not. I cannot speak to them. For, so for so them. why are you confident that won't happen again? I do know we have a, cap a capability to uh, assist many of these patients in a manner that we did not have uh, during Sandy. Again, I'm not, uh, what I'm saying is that I just want to make sure that they know what they're obligated to do and they're doing it to keep their patients and our residents safe. That's, and quite frankly, the hospital, I could speak for Coney Island Hospital, we were so fortunate due to the amazing staff they didn't lose any lives uh, during that. It was a, an incredible Herculean effort there. But they also had to utilize precious resources and time rather than to be with patients 24-7, figure out who was at their door when they themselves were inundated by the storm. So I just want to make sure, or, and also I heard the same thing from Maimonides and other, other hospitals. So again, I understanding this is a, these are state licensed facilities, but they're also our, our residents. So just to summarize and wrap up a um, couple of last items. So you mentioned that at some point there will be like the high-rise task force report. Is that correct? Uh, the, the list of things they want to operationalize at some point. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And when can we expect that again? October 18. Is that when it's due? October. October of, of next year. Yes. Okay. And the uh, compliance with making sure that we have at least 60 sites it complying with ADA, the plan is, uh, is that as well by, by October of 2018? I believe that's, yeah. Or I believe it said September 30th. Yeah, it's 2018. a different MOU. I, I, again, I have to uh, check with our legal folks, too. Because that was what you mentioned before, that that was an extension that you, it was an extension, that you were granted. Right. 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 The, actually, the lawyers did provide me with the information, but it's on there, so I won't find it in it's time. All right. but, uh, we, I guess we, the, we, the question I have is that, are you aware of, at the moment, any plans to file for any additional extensions that we should be aware of? Because we need to be as crystal clear as possible with our residents and advocates and, of course, the public in general about when we will be in compliance w with these very important, uh, you know. No, uh, and in the interim, I mean, we're taking uh, all necessary actions to ensure that Anybody who is disabled or who has an access of functional need will receive uh, uh, the services that they require. Uh, we have uh, uh, DOE, OPT buses uh, stationed at non-compliant evacuation centers ready to transport uh, any uh, uh, person who is disabled to an accessible uh, evacuation center and or shelter. So we have uh, uh, looked to see where the gaps currently lie, and we have done our best to plug all of these gaps right now. So, uh, you know, I know you're looking at the numbers and you're saying, geez, we're supposed to have this, how come? I, I understand it, I get it. And uh, we are standing ready to plug those gaps until we could fulfill our obligation here. No, I, I, I and again, I, I, I hear what you're saying, it's just, on one hand, you have the mayor of New York City, uh, you know, saying you know climate change is real, and I believe it is real, right. and saying that we have to deal with the reality of climate change. And 
city officials routinely cr uh, critique the federal government about its lack of acknowledgement and preparedness, which I think is correct criticism that we need more work to do. But at the same time, we need to do some self-reflection here. How ready are we at the local level and what power do we have locally to be prepared? And this is, this is, this is a glaring gap, which the court recognized, which the city recognized, advocates recognized even before the storm. And we have to care for the most vulnerable. We have to care for folks that, I mean, it, it's my philosophy that government is really there to help those who really can't help themselves. And, and these are folks who need the most help during this time. And it's obvious that w we still have more work to do. And again, I say this from a place that I want to work constructively with your, I, I applaud Commissioner Esposito for being one of the most very responsive commissioners. And I, I send an email to him about an issue in my district and within literally seconds or a minute, I got a response from him or his staff. So I want to say that, saying I, wanna, I want us to be partners in this effort. I want us to get this right. But I also know that time is not on our side. So the longer we, we kind of push this back and the longer we kind of just kick it down the road, I think we, we are, uh, you know, uh, not doing a great service for folks that need help the most. So uh, again, I, I applaud the work that's been done up to this point, recognizing we still have a lot more work to do. Uh, yeah. I concur with you. And yeah. you also have to recognize the fact that we're advocates as well for the disabled and Correct. with access and functional needs. Right. And that me, my team, our agency partners are working steadfastly to get everything that needs to be accomplished, accomplished. I mean, I have a broad overview of what's happening. I haven't been able to provide you all of the specifics you're looking for. We will do that in a follow-up. It's just I don't have that information readily available. Uh, but it's not through any uh, lack of trying on our part. Uh, I know personally, uh, you know, the work groups that are ongoing and the efforts that they are making to uh, accommodate and to address all of these planning gaps. And as you tick items off, I mean, we have already thought of many of them and addressed it. So I just want to assure you and the Resiliency Committee that we are committed to meeting all of these needs uh, in a timely fashion and make all of these plans operational uh, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And, 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 I, and I appreciate what you just said, and, but just to be clear, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, say right now whether or not there'll be any additional extension requests made, is that correct? That is correct. I, I don't have that insight right now. I think we, we will probably be able to comply with uh, everything that we need to comply with uh, by the dates and times I will provide you. I believe it's October of 18. Right. And we also would appreciate uh, a heads up from the administration on these items because when I report back now to advocates in the public in my district, that this is a new date, and I find out at a, f a hearing a year later that the new date is October 2019th, that's not acceptable. Uh, it's 2018, I think, right? No, I'm saying that okay. if I find out a year from now that you've asked for another year extension, oh. <laughs> that is not how this works. We are, city council members are not just advocates. We're elected officials, and we, we have an important community. job to do sure. as well. Sure, understood. Right. Uh, and if there's... Yes, please. I'm sorry. I'm from Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. You had mentioned before you had some community groups that um, have kind of ad hoc created right. emergency preparedness. If you have them reach out to our office, we have periodic meetings with various community groups that might be helpful and we could, um, you know, make some ties and some uh, Great. introductions to I the various I'd be happy to get your business groups. card afterwards. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, we do have those groups and I do appreciate that. Um, if there's, uh, yes, Count, Council Member Perkins. Well, the groups that you have, how do you, I just now turned it on. The groups, can you hear me? So the groups that you have, how, how do you get them to have? Oh. How do they know to be had? Um, well, actually, after Sandy, the Emergency Management and Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities had a Sandy task force um, that met with community groups um, as well as uh, state agencies, city agencies, Red Cross, um, 
you know, all their various emergency uh, respond organizations and some community groups. And, that, and we've continued that um, coalition, for lack of a better term, to go forward. And we've reached out to other um, community groups. And Eli, a gentleman from my office, he, he um, heads up that task force and also is now creating it so we can have a broader expanse by making it available um, so people can call in. They don't have to physically come downtown to our office to attend the meetings. So if there are these groups that I assume uh, from all over the city, mm -hmm. right, uh, how do we know which, where they're at? Like where are the ones at in Manhattan, the Bronx, the, you know, the boroughs? How do if folks want to contact them to be engaged or somehow want to be informed? They would come to our office and we would connect them. Through you, you can mm -hmm. they could connect mm -hmm. them? Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that it, uh, Council? So, for instance, if they wanted to know all of those that were in a specific neighborhood or a specific borough, through you, we could get that list? We don't, uh, I mean, uh, we don't have like every community group in, say, the Bronx or Manhattan. No, no, we, I don't think you right. Well, we we have diff various groups that we work with that we could, um, if someone contacted our office and needed a connection, we could right. try to connect them to the appropriate organization or agency. Yeah, that's exactly what I was asking. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Councilmember Perkins, and if. Uh, that is all, then we, we thank the panel. Uh, th thank you for your work and thank you for your time here today. Oh, and there's no one signed up to speak or to ask questions. Okay, well, uh, we, we, is there anyone that wants That's to speak? Uh, you could just sign Sergeant at Arms, but if not, uh, we recognize there's still more work to do, but we do uh, thank you for the progress that's been made so far. And with that, uh, the hearing is adjourned.